Tired of long waits and rushed care at the ER and urgent care clinic? Next time, stay home and let Dispatch Health bring the power of the hospital to you. I call Dispatch Health. A care team of medical professionals actually come to your house. They're the same caliber of people that you would see if you were at a hospital or an urgent care. Dispatch Health can treat most non-life-threatening emergencies. They can do the x-rays, they can do stitches. Urinary tract infections, blood tests, urinalysis, ultrasound. It's almost everything that they can do at the ER. You never feel rushed. They're there for you and only you. I felt like their only patient. And it costs no more than a trip to urgent care because Dispatch Health is covered by most insurance, including Medicare. See if we serve your home at DispatchHealth.com. Dispatch Health really went above and beyond. It's wonderful to have care come to your home. House calls are back, and they're better than ever. Learn more at DispatchHealth.com. If you look for it, every day has cause for celebration. Celebrate a friend for their promotion baby wedding life thing. Celebrate yourself for keeping the couch warm. It's no easy feat, especially if it's a big couch. Or maybe you just want to celebrate living in 2022 where you can get beer, wine, and spirits delivered from Drizzly in under 60 minutes without leaving said couch. So download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com. And get your favorite drinks delivered today. Welcome to the Psychovertical Podcast. It's me, Andy Kirkpatrick, back again. And this is this is an emergency podcast. I've, I'm having to do this uh, early in the morning. Like you might be able to hear my son downstairs, like being a pain. So, um, so yeah. So <laughs> the two two reasons why this is an emergency podcast. First of all, is um, in my last podcast, I made a terrible. Well, I made two mistakes. Um, what one of the mistakes was, I said that the um, Karen Tool is the highest mountain in the British Isles. I, I, so I'm, I'm saying British Isles as in Ireland and Britain, and um, which is not true. Which is not true. Um, it's the high. It's the high. It's higher than um, than Helvellyn. Not as I as I in the scaffold bike. <laughs> oh, I've been I've been away so long. I can't remember what the highest mountain is in England. So it's it's definitely higher than Kinder Scout. And uh, is it higher than Snowden? Or Snowden? Is Snowden not as high? Anyway, it's it's fucking high, but it's not as high as as Ben Nevis. So that's so so yeah. So um so I just need to point that out. I think I think the reason is is uh, I get confused with the difference between like England and. And Great Britain and all that kind of stuff. So, so yeah. But it's uh, but Karen Tool, if that's what it's called, is uh, I highly highly recommend you uh, take a trip over to over to Kerry and uh, go and climb Karen Tool. And uh, there's lots of lots of uh, great stuff to do there. If you if you're going, if you're into films, if you're a film buff, you need to get a copy of the the book about the making of Ryan's daughter, which is a it's just a great it's a great book if you're not into films it doesn't matter if you've not seen Ryan's daughter that doesn't matter either um uh and it's it's really good but it was filmed it was filmed there it was filmed in uh, around dingle and along the the sea cliffs and stuff around there and it's just a really interesting book about the the power of nature and you know this um um david lean you know like the world's greatest film director who'd made you know, Far From the Maddening Crowd and Lawrence of Arabia and, you know, Bridge Over the River Kwai. Like, he comes he comes to Ireland to make this uh, this film and, you know, Ireland in then must have been really kind of the back and beyond. And uh, he starts making this film and it's got all this, you know, Hollywood stuff and he's got A-list. He's got Robert Mitchum living in Dingle and all this kind of stuff. And it's just like, what happens? And it's, it kind of... It kind of destroys des- destroys David Lean, kind of destroys Robert Mitchum, and um, you know, none of them were really ever the same again after it. There's a really there's a really good there's a really de- good description where he managed to get all these like young uh, Irish actors who were like you know the you know the best our uh, best you know theatre actors in Ireland. These young guys, 
and the first shot of the film is uh, these you, these guys who are playing like IRA, you know, kind of Republicans, um, sort of coming. You know, I think I think they've, they've, I've not actually seen the film since I was a kid, so I don't. I, I, there's something like the the row row show in a boat, and they've got explosives or something, and they're going through the storm, and they they get to the village, and they um they open the door, and they go into the pub. So that that was the first film, the the, the first bit of uh, footage they filmed, and they, these were like young actors, you know, like you know, young hardy looking Irishmen, and um. And then the 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 bit where it actually came into the pub was filmed about a year and a half later, and by then they'd basically been been paid to sit sit around for a year and a half, not doing anything at all, and all they did was just sit in the pub, just like drinking, you know, <laughs> drinking every day and getting, you know, basically all dying of a, much younger than they should have of like psoriasis and stuff. So, you know, the shot of them actually coming through the pub, there's these like you know fat bloated old men like come through the door into the pub so but there's the there's like so many great uh stories about the the dynamics of all the people working in the film and robert mitchum like grew his own like cannabis in the back he basically um just took over a whole a whole hotel he just he just he just took the whole hotel over and kicked everybody out and lived in this hotel and it was like crazy sort of party times and uh so yeah it's really it's really it gives a real good sense of the you know of the of the place and he describes how everywhere you went you you go into the butchers and there'd be like a somewhere you could buy a beer you know if you yeah every everywhere you went every every shop had somewhere where you could buy beer so you could have like a you know you could get in your your sausages made and you could have a pint at the same pint of guinness at the same time so highly recommend it anyway so i do apologize to the scots and I think it's just because of Irish people just keep going on about this mountain being like super high and oh it's higher than you know blah blah blah. So um so yeah so it's not it's not my fault. I'm not really into as it's, I'm not a really detail orientated person. So like I always say you should never climb a mountain you can't spell. And I don't know how to spell Karen Tool, but I have climbed it. So so yeah. So th- my other my other thing is a little bit more serious. So I had an email this morning. Um, from uh, Rick and in my last podcast I was talking about single single skin tents and about running a stove inside a tent uh, I think hopefully I think in earlier in earlier in earlier um, podcasts I've mentioned about this about carbon monoxide poisoning and about elevating your pan above the above the flame higher than normal like a few centimeters above normal so you don't get carbon monoxide poisoning and I kind of mentioned about running the stove, um, just running the stove with nothing on it in order to generate some heat, like if it's like super, super cold. And uh, so so anyway, this is from, I'll read it out. This is what Rick said. In your latest podcast, you talk about using stoves in cold climates and the benefits of petrol stoves over gas stoves. I completely agree with your advice that petrol stoves are effective at heating tents and drying equipment against the using uh, against using gas stoves you're also you also likely touched on carbon monoxide poisoning when using stoves within tents and i've noticed you covered stoves on a few other podcasts regarding denali tips tragically whilst deployed in norway with the royal marines in the early 90s we had three guys die in one tent from carbon monoxide poisoning like many other climbers i find your advice very useful and reckon there's an opportunity to add a caveat when you next respond to questions regarding the use of petrol stores in tents. Uh, in short, the guys that succumbed to see your poisoning were waiting for a four-man tent, waiting in a four-man tent for the weather to improve to do some live firing and we're using a, a peak multi-fuel stove, burning um, naphtha to keep warm. From recollection, and my understanding, they were running the stove on a low heat setting and over time the stove started to lose pressure that the burn then became too rich, producing excessive amounts of carbon monoxide. So yes, I agree. Petrol stoves are great for heating tents as long as you burn an ideal mix. The fuel is pressurized, and very importantly, the fatigue, the fatigue use, fatigued users are vigilant to the effects of carbon monoxide. So yeah, so that's a that's a very good point. Um, th- uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think. 
it's, it's, there's, there's so much. There's, it's like every. It's like everything. Like I'm. I'm writing this. So I'm writing this book at the moment about so, <laughs> top rope solo wings for some reason. And when you start going into the weeds of some things, there's so many. There's so many variables that play a part in something going wrong. Um, it's a bit like a you know like a like a, a plane crash. You know, it's never just one thing that goes wrong that causes a plane crash. It's always you know several things that all align at the same time. And you can imagine you can imagine a, a tent that has like snow valances on that's been completely um, buried into the snow or, or perhaps even buried in the snow. So there's, you know, there's, there's basically no air coming into that tent and the, you're inside the tent and you completely seal it up and you're running this stove. Not only do you have the problem of, of carbon monoxide, you've also got the problem that you're just basically burning up all the oxygen in the, in the tent as well. Um, Cause you know, it's, there's no way that the, there's no any oxygen coming into a tent that's completely buried in the snow. It's the same, you know. It's the same problem you have in a uh, uh, in a snow hole um, that you just, you know, you just basically run out of oxygen and you you're pumping all this carbon monoxide in. So, I guess in the in the past, whenever you yeah, have never, yeah, like the, the classic people people die when they use like a, they put a barbecue, you know, one of those like disposal barbecues. They bring it into a tent to try and or into a caravan to try and warm up, and it kills them. Because it's just producing so much carbon monoxide, and in the past, when you've when I've used stoves to dry stuff out, you know they're generally they're, well they're generally either in like a portal edge, which is not very um, you know there's plenty of places for the air to to, to you know waft around in there, um, or in a tent, and even, and and generally again you I've always you're always you're always conscious you don't want to run out of oxygen, so you generally even if you're producing heat. Uh, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not trying to make a sauna, so you always have the door undone, and you have like a flow of air, um, and you are kind of being being aware of it. But it's one of those, yeah, it's one of those, it's it's one of those tricky things that if you were to say, you know, if if you were saying you went up into the Arctic and you're like, or one person saying like, well, I think we should like bring the st the stove right into the middle of the tent, you know, into the you know, right into the right into the centre of the tent, and we'll run it. You know, we'll dry our kit out, and we'll you know, it'll improve our morale, and we'll do all our cooking like right in the middle of the tent. Like, I mean, right in the middle of the tent. Um, you know, the benefits of that would be uh, would be massive. You know, it might it might make a massive difference, doesn't it? You might be more successful in what you're going to do, and you might be you definitely be a lot more comfortable and everything else. Where somebody else who's like, well, I'm not going to bring the I'm going to sit outside in the wind and the snow because uh, I read that you weren't supposed to put a t a, the stove inside a tent because it's dangerous and you know I'm going to follow the follow the rules and I'm just going to get into this like frozen <laughs> you know increasingly more frozen ice palace every night and just you know shiver my ass off and probably just die of if not if I don't die of hypothermia I'll die of you know of misery and I'll, I'll just kill myself so so it is one of those it is one of those things that the there's the uh like someone someone was asking me uh I should actually go I should actually go through actually someone was asking me some questions about the climbing the nose I wanted to climb the nose and they were like firing all these questions at me and uh let's see if I can find it it might it might be like it might be in, it might be informative <laughs> To this, uh, to this, to what we're talking about, is it? It's really, it's really hard to give like an answer that's like if you if you're giving a like if I was a if I was a manufacturer, you know, and I have like I have sort of liability, and I probably maybe have liability anyway, but you know, if 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 you if you're giving sort of advice that one day may may like you know land you in court, then you know you have to give it advice which is almost like not advice you know it's uh you know it's uh it's yeah so it's, it's a tricky thing so you're trying to when you're trying to when you're trying to be it's not about being honest but it's just about being like well this is what i this is what i do you know if someone says can you do more up a you know a piece a six millimeter rope it's like well i have done but i wouldn't <laughs> i wouldn't necessarily recommend it you know you, 
you couldn't sit, you know, someone couldn't be like, well, Andy said I, sh I could, because you don't know like what kind of, what is it? Like what kind of six mil six millimeter what? Is it six millimeter accessory cord? Is it six millimeter Dyneema? Is it six mil, uh, six mil, you know, like what's the, sh what kind of sheath is it? Is it just, uh, is it polypropylene, you know, ex you know, what is it? So it's, it, with, all, with all these things, you have to sort of, you have to sort of apply, um, you know, some kind of, you just got to think like, well, this person said this, but he's not, a, like, I'm not a professional, like, I'm not a, I'm not a mountain guide or something. So, you know, whatever I say is not necessarily, uh, <laughs> you know, trustworthy. Like, I don't even know the, I don't even know the highest, uh, the highest mountain in, uh, in the British Isles. So, so yeah, um, uh, so I wonder if it's, uh, Oh no, maybe it's quite too it's too long. But it was like loads of questions back backwards and forwards about how to how to climb the nose and and they went up and they tried it and they failed and they came back down again and um so I I think in one it, it, they were asking about why you should back up a micro traction um is it what's it called now yeah micro traction uh, when you're hauling because it seemed like um. Uh, overkill uh you know you've you know why would you bother so when you back it up it just means you so you, you've got your micro traction clipped into the the b layer that you would just clip a quick draw into the into the rope as well so if the the micro traction was to just explode into nothingness then the rope would like fall down onto the quick draw so you would you, you wouldn't just like so if you were if you were hauling um, hauling along and the micro traction broke, what would happen was the whole weight of the whole bag uh, would fall onto your onto you onto your harness, and uh, um, it, you know it would it'd not be it not be ideal. Like you you, you talk about escaping the system, like yeah, you know, escaping the system with a you know hundred kilo whole bag hanging off your harness. You, you probably just have to. It'd be very, it'd be very tricky situation. You'd have to if you're there by yourself, if you, if your partner wasn't there, and if you were space hauling, uh, which meant that you know there was another person on the other end of the whole whole line, so you had like two hundred kilos hanging off of you, and one of them was a was a person, then you'd be you'd be really screwed, because uh, at least the whole bag you could always cut the rope and let the whole bag fall if you had if you had to if you're going to die otherwise, but if there's somebody else on the other end of the rope, then that's not. That's not a that's not a good not not a good option. So anyway, so he was asking about why you would bother because it seemed pointless. Like if you look at a micro if you look at micro traction, it's like how is that gonna break? It's got these two pieces of aluminium, you know, where you clip you know, the the two uh, plates on either side, and how is that gonna break? So I said, um, he said, uh, out of interest, do you personally back up your micro tracks with a quick draw whilst hauling? Uh, it seems a bit OTT. You could. Uh, you wouldn't do that during crevasse rescue, for example. And I said, if you're just hauling a bag, then no. If you're space hauling, yes. And then he replied, do you actually do they actually break though, or is it just a, th a throwback to the more Heath Robinson devices like wall haulers? So wall haulers, like the Rock Exotica wall hauler, which was like the original project um, progress capture, you know, integrated pulley uh, sender kind of thing is uh, that that was actually uh, some kind of some you know if you put a lot of a lot of weight through it like the actual arm that the the that they the uh the cam was on was actually would actually start twisting and i can imagine it, it, it could, i don't think it, bro it would break off but it wasn't you know if you put like a massive amount of weight through it it didn't didn't look very happy about it so so i replied like on a wall you have so many things that can fuck you up it's worth being extra paranoid, especially if it will kill you. With a protraction, you need to always put a crab into the bottom hole. As this can as this can open up if you're if you've not locked it down. Uh, in brackets, it's happened. You'd probably not space hole on a micro traction, but if you got 150 kilograms in your bags and two people hauling on the other side, that's a lot of force on the pulley, which might be strong enough when brand new. But what about? After ten years and lots of abuse, what happens if the locker gets forced open, which can easily happen on a messy belay, and gets twisted and loaded over the edge, and the crab breaks? Or you'll ha you'll have a, a zillion crabs on a big wall. So why not back it up? So, so yeah, so that, so that it's an that's an inter it's an interesting point I'm trying to make there, 
which is people look at something and they'll say, "Oh, look at this! Um, look at this! Look at this Kevlar cord!" Like, you know, like a, a like a, I think um, like a nine millimeter, uh, like a soft link. Now, if, if you know what a soft link is, a soft link is a, it's like a loop that you can that you can open, but you have like a you have basically like a hundred percent of the strength of the of the of the loop. Um, so it would be. Would that be stronger? Would that be stronger than a sun sling? Anyway, it's fucking strong. Like I think, I think a nine mil loop of soft link is like a maybe it's like a hundred and thirty kilonewtons of breaking strength, though. Pretty, pretty damn strong. Uh, but that's when it's brand new, straight out of the factory. So you know, you so you what you you know if you've had that. You know, if you how well did you tie it? How well have you like made up this uh, this soft link? If you made it yourself, like how good is your, you know, is your ability to you know, to to make that to make a soft link? And then what? How good is it when when you've had it for maybe you know five years and you've you know it's been used a lot? It's been you know using got wet and got dry and been left somewhere hot in a hot car and you just never. You just never really, uh, you just never really know, really. Um, like it, I think it goes across the board. Like I was reading how even say something like uh, the old COVID vaccine was supposed to be like 70 percent mnRNA, or it is, but in but the one that actually came out was only fifty percent or something. So the so the things like things change. So when you see the, the statistics or the the um, you know what it what the the strength of something of of something, you know that really is the you know what it was on the day in the factory and it does and doesn't always transfer that well to the real world. Like if you look at you know how a carabiner is tested, you know you've got your your um you know your major your uh you know what do you call it Ma minor axis and major axis and all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, you know, you know, you got your, uh, you know, cross loading everything else, but you don't really have any testing for the carabiner, like going over an edge or something. Like uh, there was a photograph of a someone found a uh, a Wiregate carabiner on the bottom of El Cap, which is which was completely twisted, so the the gate was facing in the opposite direction to the nose of the carabiner. Now, like there was. Like it's, I, I don't know, but there was, um, you know, two climbers were killed speed climbing. Was it last year, year before? And I kind of hypothesized that what could have happened was uh, basically they were moving together, and one of them fell, and and the rope was probably only only attached to the belay, probably they probably were short fixing. So one person, you know, climbs up with climbs up to the belay and just pulls up pulls up the rope so it's tight, ties a clove hitch into it, clips into a carabiner, and then starts soloing the next pitch with a big loop of rope. And the, then the other person jumars up, and when they when they reach the the belay, by then hopefully the other person has got some protection in or whatever, or they put them on belay and blah, blah, blah. So I, I, I kind of hypothesized that what happened was one of them fell, the leader fell, and the carabiner broke or became detached from the rope and the both of them fell to the bottom of El Cap and died. So uh, so I, I had a hypothesis that that potentially, you know, when you tie the you know, if you if the carabiner was to shift before the person so you 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 clip this carabiner in uh into the bolt, you pull up a load of pull up as the rope so it's tight to the to the second, you tie a clove hitch, you clip it into the thing and then you start, then you start climbing. But when you start, so you're, you see, you're climbing away from this carabiner with a big loop of rope, and your second has not weighted the the, the rope yet, because because they're now quickly putting on the jumars and whatever. Now in that in that in that time, it'd be very easy for the for the carabiner, like because this potentially is just a snap gate carabiner. It's not even a locker. Is the carabiner would would shift into a certain direction. The clove hitch would move along, so the clove hitch was actually pulling on the nose of the carabiner, and uh, the person waits the waits the rope, and that locks the locks the clove hitch in that in place on the on the nose of the carabiner, not into the not along the spine, 
and then the, the the leader falls while the other person's waiting the waiting the, the knot and then you know the, you have the weight of the the dead weight of the climber and dead weight of the leader falling onto that thing and it would be enough to break a carabiner uh like easily break could easily break a carabiner doing like that um so you know so when you see this carabiner it's completely twisted around uh, it's like wow like there's no there's no test there's no test for the, for anything like that so like like most like most gear is like is very very is very very strong but it's only it's only designed to be strong in the you know the 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 optimal kind of loading so if you have like a suboptimal loading then you you, you don't really know what's going to what's going to happen and yeah, it's it's amazing you know I've seen people like bounce test something and the the carabiner's broken like the or the bounce tested something and when they looked at the carabiner basically the gate um the gate just went backwards and forwards because the, the the you know the nose of the carabiner as 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 they were loading it the carab the the gate has fluttered so it wasn't engaged with the with the nose and uh the nose is bent out so you you know you have this carabiner that's kind of bent bending and will eventually break um so yeah so you you have to be like as i said like you have, you have to be kind of you have to be kind of paranoid about this kind of stuff um you know you you can you it's you, you know it's not worth being like totally trusting of everything it's all like sometimes when you're space hauling i've sp been space hauling where you've got a massive amount of weight like maybe you've got like 200 kilos like you're really at the maximum the maximum um your maximum load you can put on a on a, this will be like on a pro traction like a, the problem with the with a lot of the with, with all the pulleys is the is it's to do with the the amount of force that you, that the 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 cam, the eccentric eccentric cam can place on the rope without damaging it, which is probably about four hundred kilos. So if you, it's not about the pulley itself. Like the pulley is basically, you're not going to break the pulley. It's like really really strong. But if you, you know, if you're putting like four hundred kilos of a uh, force on the rope, you could like, you know, the sheath could break, and then that you don't know what's really going to happen then when that's when that starts happening. So. You know, but you've got like 200 kilos on one side of the haul line, and on the other side you've got two climbers as counterweight, and then you're hauling as well. So the the force like going through the system is like is like massive, and that's why that's why you're often better doing like double hauls. So you'll you you'll have like two haul lines, and you'll release the you release the bags, and you've basically got two haul lines hanging down with like bags on each one of them. And you'll haul them up one after the other, and that's actually a lot safer. And it's actually it can actually be quicker because one person, you know, if you're like if you're like a two person team and you're going to be on a wall for like ten days, um, you know, it means that every single every single B layer it requires two people to haul the bags up. If you're going to have to space haul, like space hauling is basically using one person's counterweight to the haul bags. So as you're hauling. That person's going down, and then they zoom are up, go down, zoom are up. So, so if you're going, um, but if you if you have two separate haul lines, so what you do is the leader leads with a zip line, which is like a, you know, like a, a thin rope, and when they get to the B layer, they pull up the two haul lines on the end of that rope, and then they usually you you put one through the pulley, the protraction, ready to haul that bag. And then the other one, you 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 put it on a on a munter hitch and then tie it off like a, um, a mule thingy, what we're going to call it. So it's, so it's releasable. So the 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 second cleans the pitch, gets to you. You could be hauling as they're cleaning the pitch, hauling one of the bags. You, uh, you give them the lead rope, you give them the zip line, and they can start leading the next pitch while you're still hauling. So when you get the first haul bag up, you tie it off, and then you put the you you attach the uh you uh you clip a jumar into the the rope you the the, the second rope that you're going to lower that, that's releasable you clip a jumar into that you release it so it's on the jumar then you put the pulley into the the slack rope you have now above the jumar clip that in start hauling take the jumar off and, and away you go so it's actually it's actually good it's a good way of doing it that's what that's how i've done it 
sometimes when I've been soloing is just do two do do two holes at the at the, at the start. You can do like a a three to one and everything else, but if the if the if the bags are getting that heavy, uh, you know you have to start worrying <laughs> worrying about you know what what damage you could do to the you know can the pulley actually take that much that much weight? Like I've used like a like a six to one and all sorts of you know other other shenanigans, but you know you you kind of you kind of limited by the by the the uh, the the device really. The, um, so yeah, so so yeah, so that so that I guess that back back to the back to the tent thing is, um, you know that's a is the same thing really is like using a using a using a stove in a tent is not an ideal situation for for obvious reasons. So you have to you know you have to kind of understand you know there's like again it's the same with like the pulley thing there's like so many bad things that could happen you could have a, a fuel leak inside your tent which will burn your tent down you could have you know you can like just simple things like knocking over knocking over water uh like boiling water is a a you could end up with like serious injury to somebody but but you could also end up with all your kit being like piss wet through uh so that's you know that, that could do, that could lead to all um, you know that, that could all that could be a catastrophic thing as well um so yeah you have to you have to really be on the on the on the game like if you ever use it if you're ever using a if you're ever on an expedition you always have to have like a, a stove board which is like a piece of wood piece of like thin thin plywood and you know it's kind of the zone where by having a board it's like a flat you know, flat surface, so it's it's less likely to get knocked over or banged, but it also kind of keep, creates like a space where nothing can, you know, that's you just don't go near that board. You kind of stay away from it. Where if you if you're trying to balance a, you know, a stove in on just on straight onto the fly sheet onto a, a carry mat, which is not a good idea because it'll set on fire, is you know you're just asking for someone to knock something. Uh, that that's a good reason why. You, creating like a housing like a like a transier style rigid you know thing that the the pan fits in and the stove goes in is like another really good idea because just again it creates just more stability it's not you're not going to easily knock the water over you're going to create like a bit of a separation it's very easy for things to sort of drift into the the flame of a stove and get set on, set on fire uh and then when one's once in the in the uh in a snow hall in in Patagonia for about about a week. Uh, I don't think I didn't go out the snow hall really for like an entire week. Just laid in there. And it wasn't a big snow hall. It was like it was like a coffin, and the stove was like between the two of us, and it was like slowly melting down, 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 down into the into the into the glacier uh, between us. And uh, anyone anyway, day it like set fire to one of the carry mats, which kind of got over too too close to the stove. And uh, you think you think there's not a lot of oxygen inside a snow hall after after a week, but wait till it's full of, you know, <laughs> you know, burning carry mat sort of stuff. It's not good. So, so yeah. So it, it, I remember. Yeah, I remember when being on a on a big wall for ages, and we were using a, a petrol stove because it was. I can't, I can't remember the petrol stove. I think because it, it was just more reliable to have a petrol stove than a than a gas stove because gas. Early gas stoves, like the Epi gas stoves and things, they were always a little bit temperamental, and you had a lot of, you know, you'd be on a route and it would just stop working, which was a pain. So we had like an MSR Dragonfly stove that was like built into a pan, so you could hang it inside a portal edge. And I remember, like after about a week of it, like when you, if you ever burped or something, you could taste petrol in your in your mouth. <laughs> Which probably that probably explains a lot of you know the, the years that followed really, so so yeah so it's uh, you do you're basically doing something hazardous so you're gonna have to basically you know there's hazardous like I'm sure if you're flying a you know a jet fighter and you you know using an ejector seat is kind of hazardous but then you're flying at you know high speed you know two hundred feet off the deck so it doesn't really you know it's all part of the all part of the game so yeah um uh any other any, i always whenever i'm always think i'm always coming up with things i should 
sort of waffle on about, but I can't, I can't really, uh, can't really think what they are. Uh, <laughs> they always, they always, they always seem like quite important at the time, but, um, but I, I should write. Them. I think David Lynch always says that you should always, you should always make notes because, like, notes are the, you know, notes are, uh, you know, these like, these bits of amazing, kind of, sort of uh, creativity and things that come to you and. And you think, oh, I'll remember that because it's a really good idea, and then you just, you know, you just, you just kind of forget. So, um, I had a, actually, I've had a few, a few emails actually about clarification and things. Like, someone was asking about in Down. There's a, there's um, there's this thing about using a f fiddle stick. I think I call it a ghost stick in there. And there's this one where you do an improvised one, and 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 how good is it and stuff. And like, it's the same thing in that. You know, whatever, a lot of things. So, so it's like, do you do you include this technique, which is a little bit dodgy, that people might find themselves, or do you? Oh no, do you do you exclude it because you're not really, you know, it's a little bit dodgy, or do you do you include it and try and explain like why it's dodgy, but then but by including it, people think it's it must be a good idea or something, or yeah, like you always. There's like there's a loads of things that you would never you'd never go out of your way to use. You know you might just play around with them, but hopefully you'll never you know you'll never use them for you know never use them for real. So so yeah, so it's always a it's always a dilemma. Like, am I gonna gonna get am I gonna get sort of um, you know like is someone gonna sue me or something? Is is I guess you just have to make sure you don't have any money. I think that's the that's the way forward. I think. So what was it? Someone was asking me the other day. Oh, it's someone in. I went to. I went to char. I was in. I was in. Uh, I went to soft play. Soft play. If you know what that is? You're not a parent. Soft play is like where you take your child and they kind of run around. And uh, like, like Noah is. He's not quite two. He's like two next week or something. And he's being. Uh, he's going through a phase of being um, sort of pushy, pushing, pushing people. But pushing people who are like a lot older than than he is, um, like I think maybe you have to take maybe you have to take it to MMA fighting or something, because he's like we we do we we do quite a lot of uh, rough rough play, would you call it? Because uh, I think it's kind of important. Like I'm trying to bring him up different different from my other kids. Um, like he's not really watched any television or he doesn't really he doesn't he doesn't know that a phone you can watch stuff on it, diggers or whatever. So so I mean trying to like. I'm trying to bring him up more of like an analog child and be more, you know, physical and all that kind of stuff. Like with with some, we had a lot of, uh, we had a lot of like this house. When this house was built, there was no path built around it. Like in Ireland, you basically have like a concrete, like I guess more houses, most houses you have like concrete path around the outside, and it helps to seal seal the house because when the rain comes down the concrete you know it goes it goes down away from the house off off the path but this hat this house never had one so it just that's why you get like rats and mice in the house because they can just like go underneath the underneath into the bottom of the house and we'll start wandering around having a having a, having a good time so anyway so having, we're, we're trying to get that done at the moment so anyway so there's a massive delivery of of stones and he was up there like you know, climbing around on the stones and with his digger and all that kind of stuff, and uh, the weather was like the weather was a horrendous. Like just like the other day, I was gonna, I was going, I decided to go down to this. There's a hotel down the road from where we live. I was like, I'll go down to this hotel and I'll I'll do some work. You know, I'll do, I've got to get this book finished. So I started walking down the road, and I, I've started trying to wear like smarter clothes because a lot of the time I just walk around with my shorts on. Like even in the middle of winter, my Crocs and my shorts. Because it didn't matter if you get you got wet because you, your legs would just dry, you know, you dry quicker. So I was like, well, I was basically walking around like a kiwi, basically. So anyway, but I, just, I decided I would just look like a bit like a homeless person after time. So I decided to start wearing wearing some proper clothes. So I've got the I've got some like smarter trousers. I've got some like suede boot shoe type things. I've got, I've got when I when my mum died, I had to buy some clothes to look like half decent. So I uh, got like a sh like a shirt like a, like not a shirt shirt but like a you know, like Levi not Levi that sounds a bit naff anyway but like a shirt I got it in South Africa like a a shirt but like a you know 
<laughs> like a shirt, like a cowboy shirt. Anyway, so but I was but I started started because I think people treat you differently. Like if you go in, if you're sitting in this hotel, you know, if you just look like a tramp, you know, you like a smelly tramp who's you know drying <laughs> everything's all his clothes are wet half the time and just drying the other half of the time. You know, people don't treat you differently. So anyway, so dressing up like a like a disguise. Um, I remember actually I don't know if I've told this story on this podcast. I once won this uh, award in Italy, in Venice, uh, a translation of Psycho Vertical, and I had to go over that. And I got this ten thousand euro prize, but I could, I'd only I could only get the money if I went there. So I I, I had no I basically just I was in the middle of something else. So I, so I had to fly, you know, I had to fly, uh, I had to fly like six in the morning. I had to drive somewhere. I basically, I had to drive all night from where I was to this airport. And then get the six uh, six a.m. flight, and then get to Venice, and then I had to get this thing. And they had to leave again at like nine o'clock. Get back in my car, and then drive all the way back to this other place. So it was just mad, mad thing. And I remember I was like, I was trying to get to this airport on the time, and I was dying for a piss. And I had to like piss into into like a McDonald's cup or something in my car, and then I spilt it on myself. And oh god, I was I just look I just turned up looking like a fucking tramp, you know, just absolutely. You know, I just look look back on it. Like, God, I just I thought I was mentally ill. I think. Anyway, so, um, but I remember being in the airport and like thinking, like, oh my God, like I feel like such a tramp. And look at these Italians; they look amazing. Like, even someone who's, you know, like a homeless person is fucking more stylish than I am. And I was thinking, like, God, what what is it? What is it about them? So a few months later, I had to do this talk in London for some somebody or other, and I was like. I really hate having to get. I really hate having to like put on a suit. I had a, I had a suit that I bought for getting buried in, and I was like, I really hate dressing like that. Like I just feel out of place. I was like, why don't I dress like an Italian? So, on the way, in, I went to Sheffield and I went to like some shop that sold like you know fancier clothes, and I just googled like dress how to dress like an Italian, and it came up with, you know, what you should wear, and I just basically bought some of these things and uh it, it did it did actually work so when i would i would dress like an italian if i was talking because i was kind of casual but it but it you put you look kind of you know it looked like you'd made a bit of an effort uh like i think the last talk i did i think i just turned up in my crocs it's like i've got these like horrible trousers i got from walmart like builder's trousers <laughs> I I I I think I'm still mentally ill because I don't I don't. It's only afterwards I always like, what the fuck were you wearing your Crocs for? Like, you were getting paid. I was getting paid like fifteen hundred quid. You know, fifteen hundred quid for like half an hour's work, and I can't even fucking put some fucking shoes on. Like, what's wrong with me? Like, I think one problem is, is someone told me they once they once got that guy uh, who does the chimneys. He used to Fred Dibner, Fred Dibner to do a talk. Uh, some fancy black tie do somewhere and anyway fred dibner turned up and he had his uh, boiler suit on it's like his oily boiler suit on for working on steam engines or something and they're like fred fred it's like black tie and he goes like these are my clothes so um, i guess that's i guess that's it to be to be uh to be yourself it's a uh, quite a big thing so what's I, what's I talking about? Oh yeah, so 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 I put my fancyish clothes on. You, you wouldn't think they were fancy if you saw me in them, but I put my fancy fancyish clothes on, and I started walking. It's probably it's probably like a mile up the road or something. I started walking up the road and it started like it started raining a little bit. So I was only gone about two hundred meters. So I I better go and get my umbrella. So I went back. I got the umbrella. Oh, yeah, so I yes, I apologise. Got this umbrella. Um, it's good. It's a good umbrella, actually. It's like one. It's one of those like, indestructible umbrellas. So, so they say. And uh, so I get my umbrella, and I, I've got I've got a coat on everything else. I start I start walking, and then it just started like pissing with rain. And it was like pissing and just crazy, crazy rain. There was like the 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 sea was all the see the sea was crazy, and then all the cars started fucking splashing me as we're driving down. I was walking along this road and. I was just absolutely fucking so- soaking. I was like, I don't, I'd only gone about half a mile. I was like, oh, this is, I'm not going to sit fucking like a, I'm going to like a wet tramp, a wet, you know, like, I feel like I'm like fallen in the sea or something. Like, so I look like I'm some, some refugee who's ended up on the wrong, you know, floated over to Ireland or something. 
So I just turned, I just turned around and walked all the way back home again and walked back in the house, just like soap, soap, it's soaking wet. So, so anyway, I don't know what, that, what the point of that story was, but um, <laughs> there is no point to it. Um, oh God, I think Noah's coming. Noah's coming up. I can hear him. He's going to start banging on the on the door in a minute. Uh, I, maybe maybe I should maybe maybe that's maybe my correction is a uh, is how long I've been talking for nearly fifty minutes. Um, yeah, I, mean, I was thinking I need, I need to I need to have some more format to these things. I should have like a uh, I should have a book thing, you know, like media corner, we call it uh, <laughs> or something. I could have like a new section, couldn't I? I? Could have a new section and his take on the current. The current news. Um, I, I, someone, yeah, someone sent me a message and they said, "Oh God, go away! I'm doing my podcast." <laughs> oh God, he's trying to get in. Yes, yeah, see, see, that's the thing is, if you don't let your kids watch screens, they get fucking obsessed with them. It's like when your mum and dad won't let you have heroin. Do you know what I mean? Like it, they're just they're just creating this this future problem. Um, that's what I, was, I think that's the problem with pornography. Like I was, I was, uh, I was telling somebody the other day that when when you were a kid, when you were younger, like everything was more communal. The, the like, so if someone bought like an album, you'd all listen to it. You know, if you got Dex's Midnight Runners album, you know, everyone would be sitting in the in the front room, front room. They all be sitting in your bed set, listening to Dex's Midnight Runners or Dead Kennedys or something. Like it wasn't. It was a bit weird, I think, to to buy a record and listen to it by yourself. If you know what I mean, you did it, but it was me. It was a more of a shared thing, and I was saying that pornography was the same. You know, I remember, you know, like if someone had some sort of video cassette of some pornography or something, which is kind of weird that it wasn't that more. It wasn't that more common that back then. Um, like pornographic magazines, I don't think. I don't know who really bought them, but you never saw anybody buying them. And they were a bit, they were, you'd, you'd only really come across like a pornographic magazine. It'd be like in a, in a wood or somewhere, like someone would have like, you know, some of the wank den or something hidden away somewhere. And uh, it, it made it much, it made it much more exciting, like pornography and things, because it was so much more forbidden. And uh, it's a bit like climbing basically in, in, you know, in England, because the weather in, in the UK, the weather's so shit that climbing has this like proper. It's a bit like pornography in the seventies and eighties. You know, it's much more kind of oh, what's going on? Like, what does rock feel like, and all that kind of stuff. So, so yeah, so so even pornography was more. Um, good job, good job. My son's not in here because he might be getting some. Might be thinking, God, my, my son might be listening to this when he's like an old man. And he'd be like, "Oh my God, my God, my father." He would be, he would be saying though, like, "Oh God, I always thought my father was such a stylish person." So yeah, so um, <laughs> so yeah, because sorry, this has been a bit. I, I think because I've had to rush this, it's not been up to my usual high standards of uh, of stuff. I, I have got some. I have got some. I was gonna. Oh, what time is it? Uh, I've got some questions. Uh, like basically, Vanessa was having. She's gonna have this baby in about two or three weeks, uh, so I've, I'm like fr frantically trying to get this book. I'm not. And there's no way I can finish this book in two or three weeks. But I'm just trying to get it, get it to some uh, some point where I can start. Get, I've got. I've got like some beta people who are gonna, not. They're not beta people, but the people who are gonna go through it. But uh, it's been taking a lot longer because what what I've been doing. Is I, so I wrote, I, I basically, I've been writing it for probably two years. It's take, it's taken, because I've not, I've really not been doing that much writing. So I've been banging that out, and then, um, and now I've been going through, going through it. But what, I've, what I've been doing, I've been doing like text to speech, so uh, listening to what it sounds like, and then trying to make it, you know, read better by listening. Because when because when you spent so so long doing something, you can't read it anymore. Because you, what you're reading is what you think it says, not what it really says. So by last, having like text to speech software, you can actually hit, listen to what it actually says, and that that's been that's been really useful. But it is actually it probably does make take a take you know five times longer to to do anything because you tend up really micro 
Like you could just hand it over to someone who could proofread it, but a proofreader doesn't really, they can't really proof it for for accuracy or are you trying, you know, what the, what they're really trying to say here. They tend to just focus on on spellings and, and grammar and stuff. So, so yeah, ho it's a bit, it's a very slow process, but hopefully it'll be interesting. A lot, a lot, a lot is it's about top rope soloing, which is fucking dull as ditch water. It, it, it is actually quite an interesting because it, it, like, if I if I could be asked, I should really expand it into a book about. It should be called Up, and it should be about Jumaring, uh, climbing ropes and stuff. Because a lot, because basically, top rope soloing is about climbing a rope, like Jumaring, um, rope ascending, blah blah blah. So I really, really, if I if I really could find it in myself to 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 get rid of the the top rope soloing bit, or make the top rope soloing bit just part of a book about climbing ropes then that would be that would be the way to do it but i just can't bring myself to 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 like i don't I, like with everything i'd say like all i need to do is i just have to include prusik loops and and some stuff like that and some some other methods of climbing ropes because i kind of covered all the main me me mechanisms of climbing a rope as part of top rope soloing but i just don't think i could do it i think it's just too I think I've just got two. I think I've got other things I want to, I want to get on with. That's, that's no way. Uh, so, um, so yeah, I think it's just going to have to be top rope soloing. And maybe I'll just, yeah. It's so, it's so easy to, it's so easy to, to get bogged down. I really, I, I, I really, really understand about myself is I have this thing like, it's like being, it's like a log jam, like an intellectual log jam is you begin something and at a certain point you realize you shouldn't be doing it. But if that point comes too far along the road, then you think, yeah, but I have to finish it now. I've spent too much time on it. And the it's almost like a is it would it be a a feed a feedback loop is the more you push against something, the harder it becomes to push. You know, the more the more you you're forcing yourself to do something, the harder it is to the harder it is to get to, to do it. What's that thing about sand? Like if you push your, you know, if you push your hand into sand very slowly, it's, you can push it quite deeply. But if you punch the sand, it's, it doesn't, you know, you don't get dug anywhere. So it's a little, a little bit like that. And I have, I have undertaken at least one project. I think that was it called like multi pitch climbing. I started doing that with somebody. I think it's on Amazon. It's on Amazon somewhere. I started doing that with uh, Dave, uh, David, who I'd met somewhere, and David Corley, and. But David had basically written almost that that entire book, and I just kind of came in at the end to to do a little bit. But I ended up it just ended up taking forever, and I really didn't enjoy doing it. And I probably just like fucked up, you know, the, all the work he'd done on it. So if you read it, it's it's all barely, basically David's work, and it's you know I'm I'm in there somewhere. But I ended up doing like the Kindle version, and oh god, it was a it was a. I should I should learn from these things, but I always think I always think something's not going to take very long. Someone said that's a dyslex a thing about to do with people who call themselves dyslexic. That's uh, that's something about time management. You always think everything's going to be take half the time, but it's you know it, it's, it takes a lot longer than you than you think. So yes, yeah, so that's where I'm at. So um, oh, is that five? Is that five? Fire engine. Uh, yeah, so I think I think I will leave it there, and I shall save my. I'm still I'm still going to be doing these podcasts with other people, but I'm just got a. I was thinking of doing a podcast that had nothing to do with climbing, and I was going to call it. <laughs> I was going to call it radioactive dog shit. What do you think about that t that title? Uh, nothing to do with climbing, just to do with with other stuff like Kanye West. Like I'm a great I'm a great supporter of Kanye West, even though he might be, you know, he might he might be. Uh, you know, um, anti-Semitic, but uh, I always think that just all you have to do is just, anything he says that people think is anti-Semitic, just pl replace the word Jew with one percent or you know white people or white men or whatever, and then just see see if it reads if it reads differently, and if it does, then you can fuck off. Anyway, so <laughs> so yeah, so can you ask? I never liked can you ask until he was being. You know, like a, a pain in the ass to everybody, and I, I quite like him. I, don't, I can't even think of any any Kanye. I once I went once went on a trip with someone who was like a massive Kanye Kanye fan, and I was just like, oh, I just don't get it, just don't get it, don't get it, don't get rap music and all that kind of stuff. But I do, I do, I 
I, uh, you know, I think, uh, can you, I uh, know this, this is, this is, I should say this for radioactive dog shit, or I would, I would, ra ah, radio, R A, rad, rads, rads, yeah, anyway, um, is, uh, oh, I forgot my point now, um, yeah, I think someone like Kanye West, this is my, this is my take on Kanye West, like Kanye West, people always talk about being woke, but I think that's, I think they're actually being the opposite of woke, they're actually asleep, they're actually putting themselves to sleep, they just, they just don't, they, 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 they already don't understand what's going on in reality anyway, because otherwise they wouldn't be going woke, so they're, but they're actually retre retreating from reality, you know, the fabric of reality and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, objective, objective reality. And so being woke is actually being in un unwoke, of being asleep. Where someone like Kanye West is, in, to my mind, he is someone who is actually waking up. And in the process of waking up, you know, it's very confusing. And you can, you can, you can, like, this, this is why people become radicalised. Because the the process of waking up or trying to understand what's going on in reality is very very painful. Going. Are you going? Okay. I mean, I'm I'm just explaining about Kanye West. I'll be there in one minute. Okay. I'm, uh, yes, I'll come with you. Yes. I just need to put my fancy clothes on. The process of waking up is very very painful, and you will say and do and think loads of crazy shit and stuff that you will later on try and deny but you just accept it you could be racist islamophobic sexist you know blah 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 and ideas will come into your head and they'll make total sense but they later on they won't or you'll just discount them that they're not helpful or whatever like i don't think i don't think women should be in uh you know should be uh able to be in uh in in you know, big governments or politics, because I think they're just, they're just, they're just, you know, they're just not good at that kind of thing. But they should be, but but men shouldn't be in charge of local politics, because they're not really good at that kind of thing. So I think, um, you know, like, I don't think you should be able to vote unless you pay a tax, you know, which is a radical idea, which if someone told me I'd think that years and years, years ago, I would, uh, I would have thought that we're like a right wing asshole, you know, but I just don't think you should be able to People shouldn't, shouldn't be able to, shouldn't be able to. People shouldn't be offer you things you you vote for. That's why, really. So, so yeah. So, so I have lots of really crazy ideas that maybe I won't think that in a few years' time. Maybe I'll think that's like a really crazy thing to say. But people should be able to, to 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 express these craziness. And yeah, they might get destroyed for it. But that doesn't matter because it doesn't matter if ultimately if you're kind of free to think and to express things like. Between 25% and 50% of all wealth in America is owned by Jewish people who make up 2% of the population. So, does that mean there's a conspiracy? No, but it means that maybe Kanye West, as a black man, should maybe look at why Jews, Jews have done so well in America. You know, so it's uh, so that, that's where he'll end up, hopefully. Instead of thinking that the Jews are trying to take over the world, he might understand why African Americans aren't. So you know, it's a, it's a it's a process. So don't don't be horrible to Kanye. Don't jump in and say, yeah, yeah, I'm never buying Adidas again. Blah blah blah. So, so yeah. Anyway, I need to go. I've gone I've gone off track now. Should have saved that for my other thing. And uh, I do apologise. And uh, until next time, goodbye. Tired of long waits and rushed care at the ER and urgent care clinic? 
Next time, stay home and let Dispatch Health bring the power of the hospital to you. I call Dispatch Health. A care team of medical professionals actually come to your house. They're the same caliber of people that you would see if you were at a hospital or an urgent care. Dispatch Health can treat most non-life-threatening emergencies. They can do the x-rays, they can do stitches. Urinary tract infections, blood tests, urinalysis, ultrasound. It's almost everything that they can do at the ER. You never feel rushed. They're there for you and only you. I felt like their only patient. And it costs no more than a trip to urgent care because Dispatch Health is covered by most insurance, including Medicare. See if we serve your home at DispatchHealth.com. Dispatch Health really went above and beyond. It's wonderful to have care come to your home. House calls are back and they're better than ever. Learn more at DispatchHealth.com. Hey, it's me, your Uncle Cooper. Sorry to interrupt your music. I do love music, especially when it's set at a reasonable volume. You know, music is really only as good as your speakers. The same is true for minivans. A minivan is only as good as the tires it sits on. And the button on the screen there, it agrees with me. If you click on it, it'll bring you to all the Cooper minivan tires that'll make your minivan a really good minivan. Go with the Coopers! Cooper! Cooper!